Mark Knopfler is one of the most successful musicians in the world. During the past 30 years, he's written and recorded over 300 songs, including some of the most famous in popular music. So love struck a Romeo, got a serenade, laying everybody low with a love song made. That ain't working, that's the way you do it. Money for nothing. Knopfler has sold over 120 million albums, both with Dire Straits and as a solo artist. Yet on the afternoon of a sellout concert in Lisbon, he's able to sit unrecognized outside a city centre cafe. For him, it would seem, it is all about the songs. He doesn't like fame. It's not about the money. And unlike most artists, he doesn't choose to live in his past. It's not Dire Straits anymore, but it's still, it's, it's, it always was him and his songs. Chisels are corn. It's time to make sawdust. Steely reminders of things left to do. Montelione, mandolins waiting. I think he's one of the greatest living songwriters going right now. My finger planes work. Excitement is the creating, and it's nothing like it. There's, it's the best feeling that there is when it's working. I'm better with my muscles than I am with my mouth. I work the fairgrounds in the summer, I'll go pick fruit down south. When I feel them chilly winds, where the weather goes, I'll follow. Pack up my traveling things, go with the swallow, and I might get lucky now and then. You win some, you might get lucky now and then. Yeah, you win some. I was born in Glasgow because my dad had gone up there to work, although my mum's family are from Newcastle. My dad was a refugee and he, he was Hungarian and he came to England in 1939. He was a firebrand young socialist and he was expelled from Hungary. He did about three stretches in prison. And he, 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 he never hurt anybody, of course. I mean, just probably uh, handed out pamphlets or some whatever he did. And he skated to Czechoslovakia and, he's, and he got out of Czechoslovakia and made it to Britain. Pretty soon after that, he got a job uh, in, in Glasgow. He wanted to work as a city architect. He wanted to try and serve society as best he could. I suppose that having a sense of what's right and wrong is just something that uh, you, you grow up with in, in your family if you're lucky enough to have that. Um, 
I really can't say any more than that, other than that I had a good upbringing from, you know, both parents did a good job, I, I like to think, I hope so anyway. When Mark was eight, the Knopfler family upped sticks and moved south to Newcastle. It was here that Mark's love of music was fired up by his boogie-woogie piano playing Uncle Kingsley. My mum's brother Kingsley had a banjo and he had played boogie-woogie piano. And the boogie-woogie was very important to me because it made a real connection with me. Um, this, this sort of big blocks just moved into place and I realised that that was for me. With Uncle Kingsley's boogie-woogie piano ringing in his ears and the rapidly emerging beat group scene, the young Mark Knopfler soon developed an obsession with guitars. I used to haunt the music shops even long before I even had a, a guitar in, and the music shops in Newcastle, I knew every inch of them. And I would probably be the little lad in there who was too nervous to, um, to take a guitar down. I didn't know how to play anyway. But I remember once it was just it was overpowering and uh, there was nothing I could do and I just picked up this Spanish guitar and took it off the hook and, and, and took it down and the voice behind me said, if you drop that, I'll drop you. For the 11-year-old Mark Knopfler, only one guitar would fit the bill and that was the Fender Stratocaster as used by his hero Hank Marvin of the Shadows. Back then I wanted to have a strap just because of the shadow sound and the twang, that's what it was. It, it's just really pick and tremolo arm, that twang. And uh, not everybody can, can, can just get that. Sometimes you get people that kind of kind of more hammy on it, you know, and it, it's just, so everybody's got a different touch on it and a hank had a beautiful vibrato on it, I always find. So always, that, that sound, thankfully, it just came kind of naturally. Just that sound. By the age of 16, while patiently waiting to go electric, Knopfler could be found finger-picking his way around the folk clubs of Newcastle. Doing things like, I'm going down that road now feeling bad, baby. Going down that road now feeling bad. Ain't gonna be treated this way. These two dog shoes just kill my feet, baby. Dollar shoes is killing my feet today. Ain't gonna be treated this way. And uh, so uh, this kind of duality going on where I'd be playing in folk places and uh, at the age of 16 and uh, wanting to play electric music as well. For a kid growing up in Newcastle in the 60s, no music was more electrifying than that of the blues. One bluesman in particular, B.B. King, would create a lasting impression on the young Mark Knopfler. He had a, a record called Live at the Regal and that was really, really important for me. It was a very definite thing happening this relationship between the voice, the guitar, and the audience that I'd never heard before and made a big impression on me, I think. The way I used to love you, baby. Baby, that's the way I hate you now. And then Bob Dylan, of course, changed it all for me as far as realising that you could write about anything. Obviously, um, the, your childhood influences, and they all, they all help, but it, they, what, what they all did, they all made me a song person and not an instrumental type person. They made me much more of a song person, not somebody who wanted to play in an orchestra. Southbound again. Oh, no, it's bound to 